This is Beyond the Big Screen Podcast with your host, Steve Guerra. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Big Screen Podcast, where we talk about great movies and stories so great they should be movies. Links to learn more about our guest today can be found in the show notes. You can support Beyond the Big Screen on Patreon.com. By joining on Patreon, you help keep Beyond the Big Screen sustainable and get many great benefits. Go to Patreon.com forward slash Beyond the Big Screen to learn more and sign up. Find show notes, links to subscribe, and leave Apple Podcast reviews by going to our website, BeyondTheBigScreen.com. And now, let's go beyond the big screen. Thank you for joining us again on Beyond the Big Screen. I am very excited to be joined by world-renowned podcaster and Australian, Gary Stevens. Gary is the host of the History in the Bible podcast. He is also a countless time guest of both Beyond the Big Screen and the History of the Papacy. I did try to count, and it is fairly much countless how many times uh, you've been a guest here. Today, we're going to take a, a, be taking a departure from our usual topics of the Bible, Judaism, Christianity, to talk about Australian history through the lens of the 1980 film Breaker Morant. And I'm going to give a little shout out to Peter from Patreon, who suggested this movie, I vaguely, not once he mentioned it, I remember seeing it, but I didn't remember any details of the movie. So maybe, Gary, tell us a little bit about how it is in Australia today, down under. <sighs> Sydney has had its wettest year in recorded history, and it's only October. Mm-hmm. We now have two seasons, and two seasons only in my country. We're either on fire or underwater. Apart from that, we're just fine. And you can't seem to moderate that at all. No, no, we can't. There are massive floods in the southern state of Victoria. Oh, it's just a complete mess. <laughs> Apart from yeah. that, we're doing really well. Now, this movie, um, Breaker Morant, maybe a place to start for us is for people who aren't as up on their Australian history. What's maybe the the very flyover, the the uh grade school history of Australia, grade school version of uh, Australian history. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, the film Breaker Morant from 1980 is set in what's in the Second Boer War, circa 1902. Australia is a very young country. We only became a country in 1901. So um, the United States became a country in... 1793 was it? Um, 1776. Ah, uh, but that was that was the start of the war. But when when was the constitution ratified? Oh, the constant. So the uh, the United States officially became a country in 17. Uh, the Declaration of Independence was in 1776. The Constitution. Uh, hopefully, I can uh, if I pass a test. 1783. 1783. That sounds right. Okay. And then the French Revolution, I believe, was in 1791 or 1793. That that sounds right. In in that general vicinity. Yes. So Australia is much, much younger than the United States. Uh, White Australia was only founded in 1788 as a British penal colony, a place to send people who had stolen chickens. Now, can you imagine that? An entire continent was one big prison. If you don't know the size of Australia, Australia is a pretty much the same size as the contiguous 50 states of the United States. It's a, it's a big place. And they turned this, this, this entire continent into a prison. It remained a dumping ground for British criminals until about the 1840s. And it was a fairly, very sparsely settled nation. States were formed, separate colonies were formed. Most of the colonies got independence from Britain in, say, the 1860s, about the time of the American Civil War, when the colonies were allowed to run themselves. Before that, they'd been run by representatives from Britain. Late 19th century, these colonies decided it's stupid that we haven't united into one single country, so they did. And that didn't happen until 1901. Now, at the time that this movie is set in 1902, pretty much all Australians would have thought of themselves as British. My great-grandparents, for example, my my maternal great-grandparents were of uh, English, Scottish, Irish descent. And even though 
most of them were born here, they literally called Britain home. So they say, oh, one day we must go home. That is, take a boat to Britain, which of course took months, and um, you know, see this home that we talk about but have never seen. So uh, Australia was very British. It did have non-British migrants in it, various Europeans. It was not the multicultural society it is today. We have uh, a very large proportion of Asians and Indians here now, for example. But in the time of this film, 1902, it was British to the boot heel. And one of the essences of Australia at that time was called the White Australia Policy. Nothing racist about no. it. No. Not at all. Not at all. And we saw ourselves as a bulwark against uh, the, the yellow menace, as it was called. Now, guess who they are? Uh, and defending the empire from the Chinese, the Japanese, you know, all these people that we don't really want here. Now we want them quite a lot. <laughs> and boy, have they improved the place. So 1902, we're part of the British Empire. We're fanatical imperialists because, of course, Britain will protect us. We couldn't protect ourselves, Australians. We had a very sparse population, a small population, distributed very sparsely over this entire continent. Unlike America, we never really penetrated much into the interior. See, I always get the impression from American history that there's a very deep sense that Americans conquered the land. You, know? uh, you tamed it might be a better way. We never did that here, mainly because three quarters of our country is completely uninhabitable desert, which that could be the reason. <laughs> uh, another quarter is completely uninhabitable jungle and, and the rest you can live on. Uh, I think Australians to this day have a sense that the land rules us, not the other way around. For example, the current floods, okay. <laughs> which devastate entire states, entire states. So in 1902, the Australians are yeah, British to the boot hills, and a lot of Australians volunteer to join the Brits in South Africa. Maybe we could talk a little bit um, to set up Edward, um, Edward uh, the Breaker Morant. That I always got a sort of a, a feeling from uh, Australia at that time, and maybe it's just something that they try to mash in to make it connect into the, the U.S. Is that there was a little bit of a Wild West feeling in Australia? Uh, I mean, that's almost in from my experience based on the movie Quigley Down Under. So maybe that doesn't. Uh, translate very well but that there was sort of a similar thing going on that there's the 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 white population going into these areas that are full of either natives or not a lot of anything of wilderness and that they're trying to tame it you're saying that it the land tamed you but it seems like they were in the british anywhere they went they tried to tame the land and conquer the land and i get that kind of feeling that there was a wild west kind of feeling going on in australia but maybe by 1902 that's calming down uh no, no i would say that that actually kept going until about the second world war the the notion of people say particularly farmers moving out of the urban areas and attempting to establish agricultural uh, zones in places which are often very remote and, and we have we have fairly poor soils here so uh, a cattle station, as we call them, I think you'd call them ranches, is that right? Yeah. Our cattle stations are the size of small European countries because not much grows there. So settlements are often very sparse. Uh, we do not have really many inland cities at all. We have inland towns, which act as service areas for the farming population. But there is a sense that, yeah, we're, we're pushing, 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 trying to, to agriculturalize the land. And given that the, the population is sparse and distant from urban centres, there certainly is a... Um, it's not as lawless as I associate the Wild West with, but it certainly is uh, isolated, and the people regard themselves as, as tough. Now, I think it's worth probably setting... You set the geography that the continent of Australia and the country of Australia is about the same size as the lower 48 U.S., but even today, what's the population of Australia? About 30 million people? Yeah, not even that, I think. Give or take. And the population of the United States is about 325 million people. So yeah. the, the sparseness of it can't be overplayed, that this is a huge area with not a lot of people on it. Yes. I mean, the U.S. is 10 times the people, and you probably have 10 times the habitable and fertile land that we do. Although we are both great immigrant nations, 
In fact, I think Australia has the highest proportion of foreign-born people outside of Israel. So, but so you get those parallels between the United States and Australia, but also some of the differences in the amount of people living there, and then this connection to the British Empire. Mm. So that's a really interesting compare and contrast going into this film and this whole story of Edward Breaker Morant. Uh, yeah, our, our deep connection to the British Empire makes it fundamentally different to the United States, although presumably very similar to Canada. Yeah. So this guy, Edward, uh, Edward Morant, who's our star of today, he's got both of those things going on. He's British to the core, and he's, mm. he's born in England, but he moves to Australia, and he becomes Australian in a sense. What can you maybe tell us a little bit about him? Uh, the movie Break Morant is about uh, a man who started off as Edwin Harry. Edwin Henry Murrant, and it's the story of his uh, court martial during the Second Boer War. Murrant is born in England, and he seems to have been a bit of a dodgy character. He moved to Australia when he was fairly young, at the age of 19, so he would have still been, he would have considered himself English, I think, without a doubt. And he must have left England under cloudy circumstances, because when he got here, he changed his name from Edward Henry Morant to Harry Harbord Morant, right? He changed all three names to something totally different. Now, he's running away from something. He's got to be. Uh, and he reinvents his past. He manages to, he gets a reputation as a horsebreaker and a drover. Uh, a drover is someone who, um, a sheep herder. Does that, does that make sense? You, you farm sheep. So that, that would have been a very typical occupation in the late 19th century in Australia. We relied hugely on our gigantic uh, wool and sheep industry. And he became also known as a womanizer. And he also became known as a poet. That's fairly common in Australia too. You will find a lot of Australian bush poets, as they're called, which seems an odd combination. Here you have this masculine, rough people working hard land who also value poetry. It's a bit of an odd combination. And he starts writing a lot of ballads, and they're, they're, they're published in Australian magazines. When the Boer War breaks out, he enlists, like a lot of Australians did, to help defend the empire, because that's what you did. And he would have been about uh, 35 or so when he went to South Africa. Now, he spends a year at the war before he goes back to England. I don't know how that happens. I would have thought as a soldier, you, know, you, you don't get to choose when you're when you're moving around, but he eventually comes back to South Africa to fight. So, in a sense, he's a mercenary, I suppose. Uh, in another sense, he he probably believes he's fighting for his country, but he does have a dodgy past. Steve here again. We are a member of the Parthenon Podcast Network, featuring great shows like Josh Cohen's Eyewitness History and many other great shows. Go to Parthenon Podcast to learn more. And now, here is a quick word from our sponsors. I, it's probably worth uh, mentioning just quickly before we move on. Edward Woodward, the actor who played him, he looked at there's that one picture that you see everywhere. If you search for um, Harry Morant, it always shows this one picture. I think uh, Edward Woodward will look quite a bit like him. Yeah, it is quite close, isn't it? And he was uh, give or take the same age. I did not realize that Edward Woodward was in the original Wicker Man. He was oh, yeah, great he was, in that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's the one who the bad thing happens to. The other actor, Brian Brown, that I think most people at least, um, is, but he was really big in the 80s and the 90s. He had a lot yes. of hits, we might say. Uh, and he was, he's a, he was a really great actor, and he was a young there as well. And I think he did very well in the, in the movie. And maybe before we move on, um, well, we can talk a little bit because it's, we're going to have to kind of weave in and out of the hist the the history and then the the basis of the movie because there's a lot of his historicity historicity involved here and nation building almost and propaganda built into this movie. Yeah, let's. So with that being said, let's start off with let's talk about where the movie comes from. 
the movie was made in 1980. Uh, it's an Australian film. Australia has always had a fairly small film industry. The movie was quite a hit here because the movie was interpreted as plucky Australians um, trying to stick it to the stuffy British. Admittedly, they failed because the movie is a court-martial by the British of Breaker Miranda and his friends. But the uh, uh, Australian characters in the film are depicted in the way we would like Australians to be depicted. You know, resolute, determined, down to earth. You call officers by their first names because everyone is equal, mate. You're not Captain Roberts. You're Phil. <laughs> yeah. And that's how we see ourselves, the exact opposite uh, of, of the British. It was a, uh, a quite successful movie here, uh, directed by Bruce Beresford, who is a fairly big name, a moderate name in the 80s. His most famous film is Driving Miss Daisy, which I remember seeing, but I, I remember almost nothing about it. Uh, apart from um, Edward Woodward, was a fairly big name uh, as an English actor. I remember him most from a spy series called Callum in the, in the Brit uh, British series in the late 70s, early 80s. And Callum was a very dark, gritty spy show at a time when spies were depicted as exotic, uh, wonderful things. You know, for example, the James Bond series, Flint, Mission, uh, Mission Impossible, all those things. Callan was the exact opposite. What was the Boer, Boer War? Uh, this was the Second Boer War, and it was definitely the last of wars of, it was definitely the last of Britain's wars of empire. The British had been there since the Napoleonic Wars. The Dutch had been there somewhat longer, uh, but the after the Napoleonic Wars, the Dutch gave Britain the colony of, it was called Cape Colony, big city, Cape Town, which is uh, still, I think, the largest city in South Africa. And the British said, okay, good, another colony, bigger empire. Every empire is, you know, the bigger, the better. And there was pretty much friction throughout the entire 19th century. The Dutch settlers are going, what the hell are you doing here? Why are you here? So there was various conflict as British immigrants moved into uh, the Cape Town colony. Some Boers moved out. They moved northward into uh, the African interior, which apparently wasn't that well populated at the time. Apparently, it was only just as the Boers were moving north into the interior, the Zulus were moving south into the same area. So apparently, the Boers weren't, weren't actually taking that much land from the natives because there weren't many Africans actually there. Anyway, so the, the, there's this constant tension between the British and the Dutch. And then they find gold and diamonds. And the British suddenly go, oh, we are now here big time. Uh, more settlers pour into the Cape Town colony. They move upwards into the Boer territory, looking for all the goodies. First Boer War, the Boers basically declare war on the British, saying, go away. We moved here to get away from you people. And now not only have you moved here, but you're taking all our gold and diamonds. That war ended up not too well for the Boers, but the British gave fairly good terms because they, they really couldn't sustain the thing. And there was a sort of a concordat reached. That, that fell down about 10 years later, leading to the Second Boer War. So again, the British figure, we have to defend our British colonists against the wicked Boers. And the war breaks out. And the Boers do very well indeed. They do very well. Uh, I think the only competent thing which the British had done at the start of the war was not wear red. They had finally gotten rid of all the old Napoleonic uniforms and were now wearing appropriate sort of tan khaki-coloured uniforms. But their actual commanders were nitwits. And during the Second Boer War, uh, which ended in the same year as this court-martial, which is depicted in the film, 1902, Eventually, the British managed to wear down the Boers with, by inventing, wait for it, the concentration camp. They, they basically rounded up the women and children, put them into these camps, and broke the will of, uh, of the Boer fighters. So good on Britain for inventing uh, uh, another tool of horror. That's about the Boer War. It's, it's a very messy, confusing thing. It seems like it was very much, like you said, you go in as the standard fair 19th century uh, colonial war. And then it comes out as a counterinsurgency, insurgency, counterinsurgency. That sound, would sound very familiar to anybody listening in the modern era. That's true. That's true. Now, you said there were lots of things going on in the United States sort of paralleling this at about this time. 
Yeah, there were some ugly uh, colonial wars in the Philippines at just about that same time, uh, early 1900s. I, I want to say that the Philippine War was in 1902, but that it all all of these war, colonial wars that the U.S. got involved with sprung out of the Spanish-American War, which was in 1898. And um, there was wars in or a lot of fighting in Cuba that um, sound very similar to what you're describing in the Boer War, where there's insurgencies. And uh, we'll, we'll hear that a lot of the, the conflict that comes out of with Breaker Morant is uh, irregular fighters, guerrilla fighters, you might call them, who are sniping. I think the word sniper might even come out of the Boer War. Oh, that's traditionally good. in the U.S. before that time, like in the Civil War, anybody who shot at long distances like that was called a sharpshooter, where now they're car called snipers. And I think it it, it was that, that was a British term, but all that sort of bushwhacking and ambushes and that sort of thing that marked that sort of colonial war were happening in a lot of other imperial wars at that time. Yeah. So this would have been the last global wars of the colonies, wouldn't it, in that sense, would it? I mean, the First World War got rid of all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I would say it's um, maybe depending on how you would classify what the Japanese was happening in China or... Sorry, I forgot about all that stuff. <laughs> uh, the French in Vietnam. I think that that sort of fighting maybe wasn't so common. Even if you take a, go back to the, the Revolutionary War, that ultimately went down to standard european fighting in the in the field there were there was some uh in what they call during that time indian fighting but irregular kind of combat but it seemed like the british going into the boer war the second boer war expected regular fighting and didn't get regular fighting, which leads to what happened with Breaker Morant. Yeah. Yeah, the Boers very cleverly did not field standing armies to fight another standing army. Uh, yeah, they basically did hit and run tactics, I suppose. Yeah. Classic guerrilla stuff. Which, which uh, gets into what did Breaker Morant do that got him into trouble? It seems that he killed civilians. And the British said, no, you can't just go killing civilians oh, and killing prisoners, prisoners of war. And one of the issues that the film goes into is, did the British high, high command in the form of Lord Kitchener actually instruct his subordinates, yes, it's fine to kill prisoners of war or not? Breaker Morant and his team says, yeah, everyone knew that. We were given permission to shoot prisoners of war or to shoot people who were not wearing military dress because they were civilians. Uh, they would, we, would, we, we, we treated them as spies and shot them. And in the trial, in the film, it's brought out, basically Kitchener denies that. He says, no, 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 I didn't give any such order. And the film leaves ambiguous as to whether Kitchener actually did. And from, I don't know what the actual history is. So basically the court-martial is a war crimes trial. Breaker Morant and two friends are arrested for killing uh, a German... Uh, pastor uh, and uh, some prisoners of war. And they maintain that they're just following orders. And the British High Command says there were no such orders. Apparently, this is the first war crimes uh, court martial in British history, which I suppose says something. So it basically invents the war crime tribunal. At the time, in 1902, when this happened, Australians were fairly outraged. It was believed here, and we, we have you know written evidence of this, it was believed in Australia at the time that British soldiers were doing this all the time, but the Australian contingent of soldiers, which included Breaker Morant, even though he was of English descent, he was still part of the Australian contingent, uh, they were being punished for doing exactly the same thing as the Brits. Um, and, and in fact, here's a quote from a magazine called The Bulletin, 1902. Why should stern justice be meted out to us whilst others go scot-free? Why should the English officer, who is a Bushveldt buccaneer, be a gentleman and a soldier, whilst we Australians are scallywags only fit for a firing party? So that stirred up quite a lot of anger. Now, by the time the film was made in 1980, everyone had forgotten the Boer War. No one had, probably no one 
hardly even heard of Breaker Morant. And the film brought this thing into our consciousness uh, spectacularly. This group that's on the Bushveld uh, carabiners, they were um, they were Australian, but it seemed like they were organized as a um, well in the modern uh, idiom we might call counterinsurgency. That they were put out there to go after these Boers. Yes, apparently they were specifically formed to counter. Uh, the Boer guerrilla tactics. So there were small, fast-moving groups of uh, cavalrymen who basically struck out. You find some Boers, you kill them. Not part of, you know, you stand up in a line and fight a sta- uh, you know, an opposing standing army. And apparently they were quite successful at it. It's one of the reasons the Boers eventually gave up. The British adopted similar tactics to them. So, uh, I mean, as you can imagine, these people would have been, they're not going to be following many rules of war, are they? Because they've been told, well, their, their whole function is not to follow the, the normal rules. But it's a huge moral issue, of course. They they set that up in the movie that um, as we go along, that that they did use outside of the box tactics, like um, that they, like you said, they traveled light. They um, they didn't have any facilities to take prisoners, so that was one of the reasons why they didn't take prisoners. And they even adopted the use of something that they call dum dum bullets. Today we would call them hollow point bullets that have been um I think I didn't do too much research into this, but I know now and it was pretty much at about that time that they well, the Geneva Convention didn't come quite then, but um that the that the the hollow point bullets, bullets that when you shoot, they expand, causing great deals of injury were uh, banned by the Geneva Convention. And I I did a little re- looking into that. The United States didn't sign on to that component of it, but still follows it. And there's all sorts of countries will say, oh, we're not, we haven't signed this, but we're still going to do it. But um, that was just, I think that was maybe one of the things to show off that this was maybe in the, a, they, I think maybe the filmmakers wanted to show that this was a proto stage that we're developing sort of this idea that there's rules to war that you can't use just any sort of tool against an, uh, an enemy that which to me, I, I've always thought that was kind of crazy that there's rules in war when you're trying to kill people. Yes, I, I suppose the whole concept of the laws of war, you think it will. Well, I'm hoping. That will be followed today because I don't want to see tactical nukes used. Um, or that the rules are applied asymmetrically, meaning that if you win, then the other, the loser has to follow the, or it gets called to task for the rules, which, and if you, and if you win, then you don't get called to task for not following the rules. But in this case, Breaker Morant does get called to task for not following the rules. The movie. To me, it isn't quite clear as to... Sorry, it does give reasons as to why he's been court-martialed in the first place. Because uh, there's a scene which shows Kitchener uh, talking to one of his subordinates. And it's implied that, yeah, we've been shooting prisoners left, right and centre so far. But we're going to stop doing that because we are now looking for peace. We are looking to get out of this mess because it's costing us a fortune for no very great effect. So we're looking t- for an accommodation with the Boers, and they did, in fact, conclude a peace uh, later that year. And also, apparently, the Germans were interested, because there are other foreign powers involved here on the periphery. There's Portugal in Mozambique to the north. There's the German colonies on the east coast and the west coast of Africa, if I remember correctly. Uh, the war itself was very looked down upon in Europe, that I know. It was viewed as an unnecessarily cruel war with these concentration camps and as viewed as, are you guys still trying to make an empire? Aren't we all over that now? I, I don't know what the opinion was in the United States if, if it actually, if the war actually impinged on American consciousness at all. But I mean, as you said, you're probably more concerned with what's happening you know, in the aftermath of the Spanish American war in the Philippines, et cetera. Maybe what are some of the highlights? I think the movie really what I and I I have liked this aspect of the movie is that it made it very ambiguous. Is Breaker Morant a monster or is he following orders? Is he just a regular guy just trying to make his way through the war? 
What were some of the highlights of the the trial? Uh, the movie captures the five or six days of the trial. I have no idea if that's how long it actually lasted or anything like that. And the whole movie it raises yeah the issues of exactly that. Um, the case of what do you mean you got we got rules of war? No, our aim is to destroy our opponent. There are no rules unless of course we're losing. Then maybe we'll invent some which you should follow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah, the Nuremberg defense, Morant is basically saying, this is what I was ordered to do. There is no book which says uh, we have a moral code. There are no uh, British laws which say that. So I'm just following orders. And the movie alternates between, it sort of sits on the fence, don't you think? Yeah, I, what I liked about this movie is that in every scene, they would show a little bit of courtroom drama, and then they would show a flashback to what was happening in the in the field and the in the battlefield or uh whatever you would want to call it because it wasn't always a battlefield but it, and it, i think it, it kept layering on ambiguity is maybe what the prosecutor saying the right is what um the defense saying is right i think though that what the thing that kept coming through to me and i don't know if that's what the filmmakers wanted to say is that the Judges were all a bunch of jerks who were just out to get Breaker and company. Yes, that, that's just quite well established in the film, isn't it? The point of this trial is to convict Breaker Morant and his friends. That's the whole point. And I think at the very beginning of the film, Kitchener says, we've sent all the important witnesses to India, all the defense witnesses. So, yes, it, it's it's a setup. And which is bizarre. I, I, do you read some of the... Um, there's the, there's some Australians and um, military law experts who say, well, hey, if Breaker got a better trial than what he could have gotten at that time. But then the movie portrays that his lawyer was just a uh, country lawyer who did wills and uh, real estate. He wasn't a military lawyer. He wasn't even a military lawyer in the fact that he was in, um, like what we would call in the United States, that he wasn't a judge advocate general, somebody who was an official military lawyer. He was just an infantryman who just so happened to be a lawyer who they plucked out to represent them. Uh, yeah. And actually, I'd just like to point out that, um, uh, the defender, the defender? Defending attorney, or whatever, uh, is played by an Australian actor called Jack Thompson, who is Jack Thompson is, uh, I think, a lot better known here than Brian Brown. He's considered, well, nowadays he'd be one of the elder statesmen of our film industry. He was famous in his younger days for living with two twins, like two wives. Oh. Okay, uh, and he's deemed to have um, uh, an excellent Australian male voice, so he does a lot of. Uh, uh, voiceover work and reading, you know, classic Australian ballads and all that sort of thing. So I thought it was actually interesting that you picked up on Brian Brown, uh, who I who I regarded as a lesser light than uh, Jack Thompson, but still that's just a uh, minor thing. Yeah. So so the de the defend defender. I mean, can you imagine what it'd have been like saying, "Okay, you're going to defend these guys." and save them from death. What? And they do make a joke about how the defendant says, yeah, I'm used to writing wills. And one of the defendants says, yeah, that might come in handy. So that was good. So, yeah, the whole thing is just this big setup. They, uh, and really in a lot of ways, a court martial is a setup. It's not a civilian trial where, you know, in any Commonwealth country, Australia, uh, Great Britain, the United States, where the, the, defendant gets a lot of protections those aren't necessarily afforded in a court martial and i i, I think that was another ambigu ambiguity that the the movie seemed to set up is that they're treating them fairly well in the prison they have a nice little room they can hang out in and uh i think they had paints or something but then uh it, they're also getting not very good counsel. The their lawyers trying his best, but their the judges aren't allowing uh, a lot aren't allowing him to bring up a lot of the legal issues. They won't call uh, Kitchener into the court martial, even though you know he was a material witness. But how are you going to let the a god sit amongst men in the 
in the jury in the courtroom. Yes, I suppose a court martial has the extra layer of complexity in that everyone stands in a certain relationship of rank to each other, don't they? So it's not just you're defending yourself in a murder charge. Um, you might be defending yourself against a prosecutor who's several ranks higher than you, and you're meant to defer to this person. Now, if it was one of us in a civilian trial, we don't defer to the prosecutor. We, we might yell and scream at them, although I don't know if that would help. But you, you couldn't do that in the court martial. You have to call them sir, etc. On top of that, too, that they're nominally citizens of a different country, which is another interesting layer that they're Australians and Australians, its own sovereign country. Now, I, apparently that there was something that said that the Australian government said, do what you may with them. They're in the British Army. And but still, that seems a little suspect to me. It does, I suppose. Yeah, In the film, it argues, well, you are in a formerly British unit with British commanders. Ergo, you are part of the British Army. And I suppose, given that Australia was literally months old as an independent country, there would have been um, some confusion, some lingering doubts as to Australian national identity, since we're just brand new born. And a lot of people thought, oh, yes, of course, we're British. What a pip -pip. Another interesting thing I thought the movie brought up, and I wonder if this was overplayed or played correctly is that every British person said how unruly the Australians were. They don't salute. They don't. Uh, they go to sleep on guard duty. They, everything that these Australians did was not to uh, proper British military protocol. And I'm wondering, is that a 1980s thing put on? Or was that really something that in... 1902 that was already something that the british felt was in the australians characters that they weren't very formal that they drank on duty uh, i think it would, would already have been present and when we fought under british command in the first world war and then in the second world war they made the same complaints you know these people they they just we, they don't follow protocol and they're still calling me phil <laughs> as opposed to colonel so the Brits have always complained about that, and we've always had that reputation. So then at the end of the day, with all of this back and forth, and I really think they do set up in the end. I mean, I was still saying, did, it, did Breaker do it? Did Breaker and, and pals do it? Did they not do it? Or were they within some sort of bounds of their authority to kill? I, I, how did you feel about that? Were you pretty confident that they kill these people? <laughs> they killed the civilians there's no question about it yeah uh yes one of them actually admits to it doesn't he uh, when he's talking to someone in the prison i i think they did because as when Morant takes the witness stand uh he says he defends shooting or well, this of the civilian by saying that uh, well i fought the boars as they fought me and he's asked uh, when he's asked what rules of engagement justify shooting at an unarmed prisoner the film depicts Morant shouting out that they applied and shot them under Rule 303. Now, 303 is the name of the rifle that they used. Uh, I used the same rifle in high school, actually. They've got quite a kick to them. I wouldn't want to use them. Uh, uh, yeah, the 303 rifle was a very successful rifle used right from the Boer War past the Second World War. So it says, yeah, Rule 303. That's why we shot them. Do you think that Breaker was the... Because they show him both ways in the movie. Is he the... Uh, honest guy just trying to do best to help his soldiers win this war that really isn't his war or is he the bl bloodthirsty i mean they sometimes show me almost looks like a vampire he's like enjoying the killing uh, what do you think of breaker because that'll lead in do we think he was justified in what he did i honestly don't know i thought it was a fairly sympathetic portrayal of breaker and and puts the blame on on the british for either being hypocrites and denying what they had in fact ordered, or, but he is, yeah, but all of them, they are depicted as pretty harsh. Yeah, you shot the prisoners. That's, that's just the war, mate. Whether you agree with that, yeah, the whole concept of rules of war. It really pulls you. I, I thought that that's what it, 
that I love that part of the movie that that the way that they did that in the movie it pulls you in so many directions. I hated the British that for putting this guy in this uh, predicament, and I didn't like that Breaker went and killed civilians and prisoners, uh, it just be just be uh, out of convenience and in revenge too because of Colonel or uh, Captain Hunt. I didn't like that. I didn't like that uh, Breaker's getting railroaded for nominally what he was told to do, but also what he kind of enjoyed doing (laughs) as well. I thought that that whole fog of war, they really did very well in the movie. The movie never shows any sympathy for the Boers, does it really? No, it doesn't. No, there is no Boer character who has a rounded personality or anything like that. One thing I found a bit weird was the incident where one of the guys visits, visits to Boer women whose husbands are out fighting. I don't know. Can you see that actually happening? I mean, if you were, that would have made them collaborators with the hated British. And particularly given that their, their husbands don't actually seem to be dead, they actually seem to be somewhere out on the veld and they're going to come back. I, I'm not sure that actually happened. I never really thought of it until you mentioned it. But the they the only way they really portray the Boers as collaborators, that guy who wore that weird homespun floppy hat, I don't remember what his name is. He's just an Australian actor, but he played a Boer with kind of a bad Dutch accent. And then those two women who um, uh, had liaisons with um, Brian Brown, they... Um, the, the the boars were pretty much universally painted in a bad light, unsympathetic light. Yes, in an unsympathetic light. They're, they're portrayed as um, a pest to be gotten rid of. You never see anything from a boar perspective, do you? The boars are pretty much just like the background to this struggle which is playing out between British officers and Australian troops. And, and the Boers are just the instigators of, the, of this, this conflict between these two other groups. They're just... Mm. Which it would have been really interesting to see. Uh, what do the Boers think about this? By this point in 1902, when the, the, when the, the trial's going on, the Boers have given up already. The war is over and they've capitulated. What do they think about all of this and whether anybody even really cared what they had to think about it? But that's an interesting aspect. The British effectively won the Second World War because they they united all the different colonies into the Republic of South Africa and they became part, they became a dominion, as it's called, in the empire. And there weren't many dominions. In the empire, there was Australia, Canada, and I think South Africa with the Dominions. They were considered to be the big brothers in the empire. Now, I'm pretty sure the South Africans were very reluctant parts of this entity. And if I remember correctly, in the Second World War, they were pretty ambivalent about supporting the British as opposed to uh, the German colonists. And in fact, there's a famous movie called um, Ice Cold in Alex, with uh, made in the maybe early 60s. Uh, and it's about this, it's set in the Second World War, and it's about this little company in a truck, and they, they go missing in the, in the African uh, desert, and they find themselves behind enemy lines, and they've got to get back to Alexandria. One of the members of this company is a Boer, and he turns out to be the traitor, uh, <laughs> giving information to the Germans. So I doubt that the British would have trusted the Boers very much. And yeah, I, I'm sure the Boers, certainly in the Second World War, would have been thinking, hmm, Germany, Britain, Germany, Britain, not sure about this. So what ultimately happens? What's the outcome of the trial against uh, Lieutenant uh, Harry Breaker Morant? And his two friends, two of them are shot. Bang. And one is let off for, he's, he's given life imprisonment, and the other two are shot. And to indicate Breaker Morant's poetic sensibilities, he writes a poem in prison the night before he's executed. So that's about it. It's um, when the movie came out, it was in, in Australia. It was it was simply interpreted as demonstrating how wonderful, noble, salt of the earth Australians are, and how perfidious, how perfidious the British are. Uh, and a lot of people interpreted it interpreted it as saying that the three people tried were innocent. And the director is quoted as saying, I never tried to portray that. I accepted from the beginning that they were guilty. 
And you noted it's a bit surprising that the, the director was surprised because the film is so ambivalent and on the side of uh, these people defending themselves in the trial. Yeah, so they, they die. Two of them die. Poor Edward Woodward, shot to your head. Steve here. We are a member of the Parthenon Podcast Network featuring great shows like Scott Rank's History Unplugged Podcast and other great podcasts. Go to ParthenonPodcast.com to learn more. And here is a quick word from our sponsors. That's what I was shocked about. I was, I'm still shocked that the, uh, that the director could be like, whoa, I'm shocked that the people would portray it. Yeah. Uh, Breaker Morant wasn't a, uh, wasn't, uh, exactly a prince out there. I mean, he was shooting people, but also it was definitely a, a part of the culture of the British military that they were not treating these, uh, boars in a particularly decent fa- fashion, especially with concentration camps and everything. I'm shocked. And even watching the movie and knowing what the ending was going to be, it just seems to me they let that one guy go uh, with a life imprisonment. I don't see how they wouldn't have just uh, basically threaded the needle and said, OK, we're going to put uh, Breaker Morant and Brian Brown. I don't remember what his character's name was, but put them in life imprisonment, too. And then you make the Australians happy, you've, and but you've still done justice, so to speak. Yeah, I don't know why they did that. I mean, had they all, all three of them been in prison, probably shortly after the war ended, they would have been released. They would have been shipped back to either England or Australia. And, well, in a sense, everyone would be happy. Yes, justice was meted out. They were imprisoned for doing bad things. But, hey, war is war. And that's basically what happened to the guy that did get life imprisonment. I think he only served a few years and then he went back to Australia and he was a little bit of a troublemaker and a rabble rouser. But um, I mean, and that's probably what Breaker Morant would have done. Maybe written a couple of um, nasty poems about the British. (laughs) That would have been it. And I, well, I mean, and if you look at it in the short term, it didn't really cause a big stir in Australia for the most part that he was um, executed. Mm. Yeah, it seems, of course, a minor outrage. But the fact that it didn't permeate our consciousness, I mean, didn't become a national legend. When the movie came out, as I said, no one had ever heard of it, really. Uh, I, I suppose 1902 to 1914, the First World War looms very large in our consciousness, very large. You know, the story of the Anzacs, uh, Gallipoli, all that sort of thing. So that probably totally swamped any memories of the Boer War. You think that's kind of the Australian foundation myth is Gallipoli and the Anzacs. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we believe that. We believe that Australia was really founded, not in 1901 when the colonies united, but in 1915 with the Anzac uh, story. And of course, the Anzac, Anzac mythos, it's everything Australians want to, as usual, plucky, salt of the earth, going on a, a mission, a hopeless mission, because of course, the Brits have ruined it. They're idiots. They're <laughs> always idiots. Sending Australians to their deaths for, and it's Winston Churchill again. <laughs> he stuffed up so many things. Um, yeah, that is our foundation myth. And to this day, the holiest day in the Australian secular calendar is Anzac Day, which I presume is the equivalent of your Veterans Day, where we have uh, services at sunrise and you're meant to attend your local cenotaph or whatever and celebrate our fallen dead. But it's, it's still called Anzac Day. It's not called, you know, uh, Veterans Day or Army Day or anything like that. It sounds like it sort of is the 4th of July jammed together with Veterans Day, that it has that element of foundation built into it as well. Do you have a holiday for the whatever of 1901? <laughs> that? Uh... No, we don't. Uh, no, we don't. Actually, <laughs> except it's January the 1st, which is my birthday. So every, everyone across the planet celebrates my birthday, of course. <laughs> it is the only universal human holiday. And I always feel so pleased to see the entire planet celebrating me. Uh, no, uh, I mean, January the 1st is get over your hangover day, isn't it, from <laughs> New Year's Eve. Every state has a, a national foundation day. We have uh, January the 26th, and it just celebrates the uh, coming of the British prison ships 
and they're convicts. Uh, the Aborigines call it Invasion Day, which is completely accurate. And January the 26th, it's just a holiday. It's a, it's a fun day. This movie, in a lot of ways, reminds me of a movie that came out in the 90s called A Few Good Men. And I wonder if A Few Good Men was really highly influenced by Breaker Morant because it it lays out almost the exact same plot that a, a, a Breaker Morant does of somebody who thinks they're doing the best and protecting their troop and their group in the military, but in a really unethical way. And I think that that really is the biggest problem. And I wonder what you think of this. In the military, their whole idea is killing people for this higher uh goal of protecting society and so where do you draw the line on what is good killing for protecting society and when do you hang the the military people out of out on a line and when they're following orders i i don't know you can you can argue yeah there there is no line there should not be a line it is it is redundant or you can say no there is something uh, I suppose there are things which are inc- contestable, like um, uh, not shooting prisoners of war. Yeah, yeah. That's- <laughs> now, that seems reasonable to, for a start. But with issues like, yeah, do we use dumb dumb bullets or not? Well, a bullet's going to kill. And, but the argument is, well, it's like killing cattle, isn't it? The argument, I suppose, is that you try to give a, pr- uh, a soldier a humane death as opposed to a lingering death or a hideous death. But you argue, well, dead's dead, so... Mm. To me, though, the thing that you could really struggle with, and you could maybe see it from Breaker Morant or any soldier's uh, perspective, is and says something like the Boer War. Breaker Morant catches these guys as prisoners. They're not soldiers as such. They don't wear uniforms. They don't have a a organized government in any way. They're they really are an insurgency. As as soon as you let these guys out, as soon as they're fifteen. feet away uh three meters they're going to be <laughs> shooting at you again and so the, the breaker morant is a leader he's got to be worried about his troops you know he has a moral duty to them as well and so he has to make the choice if i let these guys loose and as soon as they get a gun in their hand they're going to be shooting at us again that's another issue at hand. Uh, it is indeed, and Breaker has a point. If you let these people go, given that they wear, yeah, they, they don't have, given that they're running a, a guerrilla insurgency, they can be back in action the next day, can't they? So from Iran's point of view, you either lock these people up indefinitely, but that involves a huge amount of effort, including having to feed them. So we just shoot them. Or, and on top of that, I think layered on top of that, if Moran Morant had just had very clear orders that don't shoot prisoners, but it's kind of like the, the whatever is filtering down the chain of command, don't shoot them. Yeah, shoot them. The, he's also got that at play as well. Officially, don't shoot them, but yeah, just shoot them. Hmm. I'd like to know if the uh, don't shoot order was in writing. Did they actually have pieces of paper saying not to? In which case, for your own legal protection, you'd think you'd, uh, you'd, think you'd adhere to it. But it's a war. Yeah. And horrible things happen in war. You're not thinking of the law book. You're not thinking you'll ever be court-martialed for doing what you think uh, has been ordered. But then, but then was it? Goring made the same argument, didn't he, at Nuremberg? And I don't think that Breaker... Nessa, if I could see if Breaker didn't want to follow those rules then he would want to have an order saying, kill them, kill the prisoners. So that when he killed the prisoners, he had, but so he had no problem really with killing the prisoners. So then that point was really moot to have the, the, the verbal confirmation was fine by him. Uh, yes. I mean, uh, the movie strongly implies that there, there were no written orders, certainly to, to shoot the prisoners. But as Morant says at one point, yeah, everyone knew it. Well, That gives Kitchener a big out. I didn't say anything. I said nothing. And it really was. If if you look at it from Kitchener's point of view, he's killed colonials. He hasn't killed Englishmen who might make a, especially uh, officer, high uh, aristocrat. I mean, basically officers in the British military were somebody's 
who would have somebody back at home who would have had a problem with that. <laughs> that, that that's true. They, the, the officers certainly all came from the upper classes, right right through to the end of the First World War, as far as I know. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and the UK has always been a more class bound society than either the United States or Canada or Australia, where, where class actually does mean something. I mean, they still make people lord and something, something, don't they? All the time. Yeah, definitely. And class and economic class and all that means a lot more, even to this day, in a lot of ways in England than it does, or Britain than it does in the rest of the Anglosphere. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, and things like accent, that's important. In, in the UK, and accent is, is well, uh, as, as a class marker. Because remember how Margaret Thatcher had to learn to specifically took training to drop her native accent and adopt um, a posh accent. Now, in, a, in the United States and Australia, that would be considered ridiculous. No, you talk as you talk, whatever. It just doesn't matter. So what would be your... Uh speaking as your uh, place as the official Australian here, <laughs> yeah. talking that this movie is about Australia, it's kind of old, uh, being from 1980, it's uh, 40 year, 40 plus years old. Do you think this is worth somebody going out and watching today? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> uh, it doesn't have brilliant cinematography. The cinematography is fairly standard. It's solid. But we're not looking at, you know, Orson Welles type innovation. So that doesn't have much to commend it. I, I think the acting is fine. The subject is pretty, it's pretty dire, isn't it? The colors are fairly muted. It's all, it's all sort of khaki and dark green and darkish browns. I'd recommend it to an Australian. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know if Americans would, would have much interest in it, frankly. What do you think? I think that if you, if you ignore and look at go into it to watch something of a little piece of history and kind of a, an interesting courtroom drama and an interesting moral issue at hand, but you really do, you have to ignore that the cinematography is a little dated, the acting's a little a, a very stage more than film, I would say. Actually, you've got a good point, which could be because apparently it started off as a play. So, yes, it, it, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. It is almost like they have yeah, trans translated uh, the play to, to film, haven't they? And quite often that doesn't work very well unless you're very clever about doing it. It still looks like a play. So you're quite right, yeah, it looks more like a play than a film. But if you ignore all of those issues, I think that it's it's an entertaining movie. And I I would watch it. Just for those issues at hand, if you wanted to uh, really go into a deep, dark place and watch that and watch A Few Good Men and maybe Zero Dark Thirty and a few of these other movies that look at the ambiguity of war, I think that it fits in quite well with any of those. Yeah. Yes. And the movie never really takes a stand one way or the other, I suppose. Yeah, I, I, I suppose moderately entertaining, but um, I wouldn't expect the whole family to enjoy it. No, certainly not. And so really with that, I think you leave people with a really interesting piece of Australian history and Australian mythology. I, I very hope that soon we'll hear Gary again on History of the Papacy or be on the big screen talking about all things Bible. And you should definitely check out his History in the Bible podcast. And it's good night from me. Sorry. And it's Good day. We, <laughs> Go yeah, except good day always means hello. Um, <laughs> and it's aloha from me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's no classical a goodbye. Good day is only a Yeah, hello. good day is only good day is only is hello. It's never you never say good day when you're leaving. People you're classic toodles. <laughs> oh, that's it. Of course, toodles. Toodles. <laughs>